Enrico, you know the story from three weeks ago. I was in PTC Orb, another of Nestle's locations, and we were shown that the consumer will soon have a handheld near-infrared device. So it's big data in the sense it's mm -hmm. complicated chemometrics, all the data in the cloud. I find it kind of scary that the consumer can open a Nestle or Unilever or any manufacturer's infant formula product, ask this device to say, what's my protein? They don't understand variability. It will be a measurement system probably very off. Mm. I think it's quite scary. I agree. I agree, Scott. Um, the, product, the, the, the product is called Telspec, and I think there's more than one prototype currently being discussed, but it's handheld, it's near-infrared, it fits in the palm of your hand, it speaks with your smartphone. The data are uploaded to the, to the cloud, so you mix it with whatever el else consumers are uploading, and then you get an interpretation, and I agree with you. Um, it doesn't fulfill anything like the robust requirements that we would uh, assign to a, an analytical method today, especially non-targeted one. And I think you're right, it's going to generate some very interesting discussions because it's a powerful analytical, in principle, a powerful analytical tool in the hands of anybody who wants, who has the money to buy it. But equally, I think the manufacturers are claiming things that are simply not possible to claim, including allergen detection, for example, where, you know, even at the PPM level, an allergen will potentially cause a problem for consumers. So I, I think some of, the, some of the advertising is bordering on the irresponsible. Having said that, there might be, again, like every cloud, there is a potential silver lining. And I can tell you one of the things we looked at this device for as a possible um, application is looking at um, pipe work. When, when we want to look at tubing, and we want, we, rather than taking a sample of the tube and measuring it chemically for the presence of, of, of phthalates, which are plasticizers, um, near infrared is a fantastic tool to say, is it there or not? Quali qualitative, pure and simple. It might be a, useful for that type of application. So there may be some industrial applications but we'd have to look at it to be, to be sure. Quantitatively, I'm not so sure. Qualitatively, it might have some useful things to offer. Are there other questions regarding the two presentations? I, I had a question for Sebastian. <laughs> and it, it's, it's around the... Um, batch release, uh, line release. H how much line release takes place currently in, in the pharma industry? Because it's something, of course, that the food industry is looking into. Um, how, you know, it, there's a, it's, it's very appealing to, to consider this. Uh, today we, we have, for many of our, our products, especially the more sensitive products, we've got positive release. So you've got to go through a whole catalog of lab tests before the product is released. And that could take 10, 15 days of blocked product before you do that. So line release is very, very appealing. H how much is it currently implemented in other industries? Do you know? In the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, very few. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, you have uh, uh, more uh, regulatory um, yeah, yeah. requests and uh, requirements. So, um, but this is, I mean, this is a trend. This is uh, what the people are working. Mm. Uh, and, you know, you, you can, you can um, consider this uh, for uh, other uh, goals that I mentioned. So this is uh, very interesting for process understanding, process mm. optimization, and then for even for screening, I mean, uh, for your uh, release mm. at the end. So, but I think this is the direction. I think your last slide was important as well. You can't measure everything in line that you can currently measure in a laboratory. So the challenge then, I guess, is one of equivalence. Um, being sufficiently confident that you've characterized your process and the process variability and the process quality, 
using the parameters you have available to you and ensuring that that is equivalent to the existing positive release approach using lab data. How, how would you go about building an equivalency? Yeah, this is uh, all the, the, the PAT approach uh, is based, I think, on um, yeah, the, the CQA, so critical quality attributes. And uh, um, so they have to be identified uh, first, of course, and to, to see, as you say, um, the link uh, to the specific, the, the existing specification, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. But um, could, could you do it purely using statistical approaches, or would you would you be confident using statistical methods to do that, or would you want more? Would you want biology and chemistry as well? Um, it depends, but um, I think uh, sometimes you have some surprises uh, to link this uh, kind of uh, CQA measurements and um, specifications in the sense that the specifications, they are built in a um, univariate way. Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes you have one product which meets all your uh, univariate specifications, yeah. uh, but you have, you have some, some return from, from uh, yeah. consumers or uh, yeah. clients. Mm -hmm. so. mm. And of course, rarely are they, you know, the, the parameters, the spec, the spec parameters, of course, are connected. They're rarely are they purely univariate. Yeah. I have a question to Sebastian. Is <coughs> uh, the question was more on the um, outcome, or more or less what you want to uh, predict with uh, your process thing? Is it only quality, or do you have also safety kind of parameters? Because if I go back to John's question, um, most of the thing that makes that it takes time to release a product is mainly something that is linked to contamination or safety <coughs> questions. And for sure it's great if we can uh, model what is concerning quality, but have you ever seen or heard that we were able to model something that was more linked to safety? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, from, from a data analysis point of view, uh, your wife can be uh, anything. I mean, either quantitative, qualitative, so it can be, um, uh, it can deal with, uh, with uh, safety. But uh, that, that's true that um, in the different implementations uh, we participate, uh, it's, more, it's, it's less about safety than uh, about quality. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe someone has uh, the answer to, to this question. Maybe Safety is difficult because you have to consider the vulnerability of the consumer as well. So you add another parameter, which which complicates it even more. Um, we did these models. I think they're published now. We did these models last year on the inactivation of viruses. You know the studies um, and in extrusion. And when I went to see the the, the, the scientists who were doing this, um, what shocked me was the variability in the models. You, you had three, four orders of magnitude between the upper bound risk and the lower bound risks. At least, it might have been more even, which didn't make me feel good at all, you know, because you, you have to, when you're talking about, you know, when you're talking about safety, you've got to talk about upper bound risks. You, you can't say, well, you can't work on the average. The average is a terrible thing. So you have to work on the upper bound. And if you've got all that variability, you've got you, you can end up in a very difficult position. Sebastian, in your last slide, you gave a list of challenges, quite interesting technical challenges. But before, I would like to speak and talk about a big challenge, a bigger challenge perhaps. It is about um, um, educating and implementing uh, basic or simple SPC in companies. So what you're mentioning, what you talked about, it was a high-level SPC. And uh, I will be really happy to implement that uh, in Nestle or to see that in a lot of companies. But the big question is, uh, what would you recommend? And it's also a question for you, uh, John. What would you recommend uh, uh, to, to make sure that it is well implemented everywhere and to have SPC in our business culture, in our uh, business DNA, actually? 
and uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's something quite um, maybe more popular in pharma industries. Uh, it started to become huge. It's in, it is important for Nestlé, of course, but uh, uh, I think we need to go a step further in order to reach the level of uh, uh, the high level of, of SPC that you are proposing, uh, Sebastian. Mm. Yeah, I think we, we have a good uh, example in um, in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean. Uh, the impulse came from uh, the regulatory agency. So, <laughs> I don't so know what, what Well, I think pharma have an advantage as well that they have a highly standardized um, business environment. As you said, everything is prescribed from a regulatory point of view. There's very little opportunity to deviate. The, the processes are designed for the purpose in the food industry, there's still a lot of legacy processes. For, for many of the things we do today, many of the transformations, we wouldn't potentially start with the processes we have. Then you've got raw material variability. You, you've got a lot of existing sources of variability that come into it, um, which I think is the big challenge we've got in food that isn't in pharma. It may be an argument, you know, for, uh, as you said, Enrico, more, more application of SPC in food. So may we still have, I would say, three minutes, according to the organizers. Thank you for these extra minutes. Um, coming back to what uh, we were discussing just now, uh, I would like to um, say a few words about uh, Deming. Probably you heard about this guy, Deming. He was an American statistician. He's one of the fathers of uh, statistical process control. Probably you heard about him uh, regarding the uh, continuous improvement uh, damming rule, plan, do, check, and act. Mm -hmm. Some concepts that are still valid and widely applied in, uh, in the industry. And uh, so uh, w w damming was American. And surprisingly, statistical process control uh, started to be very popular first in Japan in the 50s, and not in the US. Um, the reason is very simple. It is because top leaders, top management in Japan accepted to get trained by, by Deming. So there was a, a, a it was not a one day training, it was a six months training. So every day Deming was with that, uh, those guys, they get trained, they learn statistical thinking, they learned statistical <coughs> process control and statistical process control became the pillar of Japanese industry, the pillar of what we call the um, economic miracle, Japanese miracle. So cannot we learn from that experience? I, I think Deming, you know, it was as much cultural as it was scientific. And the spirit of plan, do, check, act, the, the spirit of continuous improvement is something we have to live in safety and quality uh, management. Um, I, and I think there's another thing as well as we talk a lot right now about culture, safety culture, quality culture, which is, is all about Deming, but it, it's also about movement to action, taking action when you, when you see the, the, the cause for action. And I, I think the danger is that there is a danger of becoming complacent and ignoring the signals that Deming always said to be looking for. Because again, in a complex environment, we create distractions. We've got to simplify, to your point again. We've got to simplify such that the action is possible when it's necessary. And I think that's what Deming would, would be arguing for, is not to be distracted. There's an interesting book called um, Flawless Execution, written by a few of the, the, um, the people who used to fly the F, F-16s, the fighters. And in the cockpit, I think, is it 150 different pieces of data, information on the panels? The, the, the guideline to the pilots is basically look at, you look at five to eight things. That's all you can manage. If you're flying at, at, at 50 feet above the ground, you, you've got to focus on the essential stuff. And that's the key. And I, I had some discussions with people in Nestle operations about that. You know, you've got to really focus, focus, focus. I said, yeah, but that's common sense. That's what the smart people do, is that they, they really focus on the things that actually count. 
Th that doesn't mean that they're not aware of the other stuff, but they're managing based on the key parameters. That's what we have to do. Scott, for a last question. One more comment. So Deming had 80% of Japan's economic kind of manufacturers in his audience. So, but the country was in a terrible crisis. A more recent example maybe is Ford. Is we, even though we can look to the 50s, we can also look more recent. You know, the Ford CEO, the chairman, he was named mm -hmm. CEO President of the Year. And in the 80s, Ford were in a desperate, desperate state. And my reading tells me that top management gets interested in SPC only when the company is in a desperate state. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, is there another question, a comment? The, the book to read, Scott, is Liker's book. And is it Jeffrey? Jeffrey Liker? He bought the book, The Toyota Way, which again builds on Deming. And it builds on the culture. I, I, like, I like what I read Liker's book. I like what I read about is culture and, and uh, you know, souci d'excellence, you know, the really real dedication to making things better. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe before finishing, I have a, a question, and I think it's the right place to ask it for all of you. It's the right conference. I was wondering, is there an official translation of big data in French? <laughs> <laughs> I read and heard a lot of things. Données massive. Données énormes. <laughs> données énormes, grosses données. Is there an official translation or do we? No, apparently no. Maybe in Quebec, but not in France. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I don't know if we can say that there is an official translation, but what we use for the statistical French society is uh, données massive. Okay. So okay. It's nothing official, but it's commonly used uh, in uh, the general uh, discussion in France, but most of the people use big data as well. Okay, thank you. I think we can close this, uh, we can close this round table. Thank you very much. I think that Nicola has a